Up next, a music teacher is found dead. Is it an accident or murder? There were forensic teams going in and out of the house for days on end. Luminol provides some answers. It just lit up like a Christmas tree. It, it was phenomenal. She didn't have any enemies. That's why it was thought to be an intruder case. But sometimes friends are more dangerous than enemies. Secrets that have been kept for so many years finally caused the whole thing to explode. <laughs> Music played an integral part in the lives of Ken Fitzhugh and his wife, Christine. They met as young people, and I think they shared a love of music. That's kind of what got their relationship going, and they married a couple of years after that. Ken and Christine lived in Palo Alto, California, where they raised two sons. Christine was a music teacher in the local public school. Ken was a real estate consultant. Life was going well for the couple until one day in 2000, when Ken got a call from Christine's school. Christine had failed to show up for her uh, one o'clock music uh, class. And this was very unusual. She was very punctual. She was very much a perfectionist. Ken had no idea where she was. So he and two co-workers drove to the house to see if she was there. When they arrived, they found Christine's car in the driveway. Christine. Christine. Inside, they found Christine lying in a pool of blood. One of Ken's co-workers called 911. This is from the Tavita Avenue. What's going on? Somebody has just fallen down the stairs. She fell down the stairs and hit her head. Is she still breathing? I don't think so. When paramedics arrived, there was little they could do. She is dead by the time they, are, they have arrived. At first glance, it looked as if Christine had tripped while carrying the laundry down the stairs. This staircase had maybe 15 stairs in it, and she was near the bottom, feet extending upward. Apparently, her head hit a ship's bell that they stored in the basement near the steps. He said that she was wearing some sort of dangerous black shoes that she had tripped on once before. But to investigators, something about the placement of the shoes didn't seem right. I noticed halfway up the staircase, it was a right shoe. It was on the left side of the staircase as you're descending. It was going up the stairs. It's not going to fall in this position. That was a little bit odd to me. During Christine's autopsy, the medical examiner found evidence inconsistent with a fall. She had seven lacerations to the back of her head, and those were at multiple angles. What it told us was she had some type of impact to the back of her head, multiple blows. At that point, we knew that there's no way that she got that many wounds falling down the stairs and they found more than just head injuries. She had also been manually strangled. This indicated to us that, that we had a homicide situation, an assault against this woman. To hear the coroner describe what happened to Christine Fitzhugh, you would have to think that this murder was committed by some inhuman monster. News of public school teacher Christine Fitzhugh's death spread quickly throughout the Palo Alto community. She was a person who clearly touched each and every child she came in contact with and had a kind of, one of that, that special magic that brings school to life. And in her case, it was in the area of music. At first, Christine's death appeared to be an accident. But when the medical examiner found evidence consistent with a homicide, investigators took over the scene. I said, I want the crime scene team to go in this house, and I want them to start on it, and I want them on their hands and knees to crawl through this whole place. I want you to find any evidence of what has occurred here. And there were forensic teams going in and out of the house for days on end, and uh, we kept asking the police, how much longer is this going to go on? Investigators believe that Christine was murdered sometime between 12.20 PM and 1.40 p.m. 
we were able to get the receipt, so we knew that at, you know, 1220-ish that she was alive and buying coffee at a local coffee house. Christine's husband and two co-workers found her body and called 911 at 1.40 p.m. The murder had to have occurred relatively close in proximity to this attempted resuscitation. Because if it had occurred several hours earlier, you're going to get a lot of coagulation of that blood. Six months before Christine's murder, there had been six home burglaries in the Fitzhugh's neighborhood. There was a lot of talk that this might have been the result of some burglary gone bad, that Christine might have surprised a burglar, and, and this is what happened to her. All of the robberies had occurred in the daytime. And like Christine's case, there was no forced entry into any of the homes. Those robberies were still unsolved. The police were in a tough spot. They had to kind of reassure the public that there wasn't a, a maniacal killer out there. We got a, a security system. The people in back of me got a security. They get a little edgy. And now it, they'll be a little bit more edgy. But nothing had been stolen from the Fitzhugh's house. And something bothered investigators. They found no blood spatter on the stairs or on the adjacent walls. Whenever a beating takes place, when blood comes to the surface, subsequent blows start to disperse that blood. And it causes blood to be spattered onto the surrounding surfaces. Those characteristic patterns weren't seen down in the basement. This meant Christine hadn't been killed in the basement where her body was found. Upstairs in the kitchen, investigators found small drops of blood on the leg and seat of a kitchen chair, indicating Christine might have been attacked while eating her lunch. We were comfortable with some blunt force injury with an edged surface, like a, the edge of a two by four. And the obvious object that was right in the center of that crime scene was the table itself. And the table had supports and then a cross member that served as the footing, if you will, of the table. That was something that her head was forcibly struck against that type of an object. The room was sprayed with luminol, and even seasoned crime scene analysts couldn't believe what they were seeing. It just lit up like a Christmas tree. It, it was phenomenal. It was clear the chair in the kitchen had recently been covered in blood. A nearby kitchen wall also showed evidence of a brutal confrontation. The landing between the kitchen and the basement looked as if Christine had been lying there in a pool of blood. There were some shoe print patterns in the area of the kitchen door. And the basement stairs left no doubt that she'd been dragged there after she'd sustained massive injuries. It was obvious that we were standing where a very brutal event had taken place. An event that was followed by an extensive cleanup. To the naked eye, you could see nothing. It was completely clean. But why would a killer spend all this time cleaning the crime scene? It was a whodunit, it was a murder in a beautiful place, and we just knew that at that point it was gonna be a big story. No one in Palo Alto, California could imagine who would want to hurt Christine Fitzhugh. She had no known enemies, and on the surface, the Fitzhughes appeared to have a storybook marriage. Ken and Christine inherited a large sum of money from Ken's family and rarely had to worry about their finances. By the time that the Fitzhughes moved to Palo Alto, they had about $2 million in real money. But investigators learned a troubling fact about their finances. Because of failed business ventures and flagrant overspending, the Fitzhughes were virtually bankrupt. They had a lot of financial problems. They were not going to be able to make their mortgage, and that was going to be public soon enough. Their financial house of cards was kind of crumbling down at the time of this homicide. Christine's closest friends told police the stress of impending bankruptcy was eating away at their marriage. 
Christine was thinking of leaving Ken and taking her half of the house and separating from his life completely. We'll sell the house, you'll take half, I'll take half. But there was something else that bothered investigators. I'm going up the stairs, there's a large photo. It's of the victim, her husband, Ken Fitzhugh, and their two children. Hey, Lieutenant. What's up? Take a look at this. This boy doesn't look like his brother. I, I comment to my supervisor. One of the children don't look like the other or, or the parents. That don't look quite right. And later, during Ken Fitzhugh's police interrogation, investigators noticed Ken referred to his son in an odd way. Her older son graduates from college in a couple weeks. She wanted to be there for that, too. It's really a sad time. You said her older son. Is he not your son? No, he's our son. Further investigation helped explain this slip. Shortly after Ken and Christine were married in 1966, Ken became friends with a co-worker named Bob Brown. And they both worked at the San Diego Aerospace Contractor back in the late 1960s. Ended up, the three of them, hanging out together all the time. And um, Robert Brown was in and around the family all the time. As a result, Bob Brown's relationship with Christine soon went beyond friendship. He's having an affair with Christine. As Bob put it, uh, he thought that Christine was starved for affection. All right, so Christine and Bob have this affair that goes on for many years. When Christine got pregnant and gave birth to her oldest son, Justin, sources told police that Ken was not the boy's biological father. It was Bob Brown. Robert maintained his friendship. Matter of fact, he was actually Justin's godfather. To confirm Justin's paternity, investigators tracked down Robert Brown. We end up finding Robert Brown, and he says, yes, I am the father of her oldest son. We get DNA testing done um, and confirm that he is the father of uh, the oldest boy. But as Justin got older and was about to go out on his own, Christine decided it was time to tell him the truth. Justin was about to graduate, and Christine wanted to invite his biological father to the graduation. And it was going to be sort of at the graduation that she was going to reveal to everybody that this other man was his father, not Mr. Fitzhugh. Ken claimed he was unaware Justin was not his biological child. Well, I, I of course, asked him. And he claims that he had no idea about it. And the friends all seemed to think he didn't know. Certainly, the son didn't know. I believe Ken knew about the affair, and I believe Ken knew who Justin's biological father was. There is no way that Christine would have gone and told Justin that Robert Brown was his father and think that Ken wouldn't have known. She certainly would have told him that I'm going to tell him. In the meantime, police didn't tell Ken Fitzhugh that the autopsy findings indicated Christine's death was a homicide. Ken remained under the impression her death would be ruled an accident. During questioning, Ken had difficulty playing the role of bereaved husband. I must have told her six times to get rid of the black shoes, and then she bought some red ones just like them. And she'd, she'd get dressed and she'd say, how do I look? And I'd say, well, fine, except I wouldn't wear those damn black shoes. You're going to fall. And there they were on the stair. He was doing a bad job of acting because he was overacting. So. Then I saw the black shoes. Oh, the goddamn black shoes! <laughs> I think he had been acting for that whole day. But this was just opinion, not proof of murder. And more important for investigators, Ken had never hurt anyone in his life. Unless police could find forensic evidence to tie Ken Fitzhugh to the crime scene, a jury probably wouldn't believe it either. 
Ken Fitzhugh denied any involvement in his wife's murder. Police found no evidence of his involvement inside the house, but when they got a search warrant for Ken's SUV, that was another story. We found bloody shoes and a bloody shirt under the driver's seat of the Suburban. There was also a paper towel soaked in blood, blood that matched Christine's DNA. Ken said there was a simple explanation. He tells me that this blood came from a gardening accident. He said Christine and him were in the backyard the uh, previous week, and she had hit her hand with a gardening tool. Christine's body was still in the morgue. Investigators asked pathologists to check her hands. There was no wounds on her hands. And even though there was no blood on the soles of Ken's shoes, this luminol pattern made it clear he'd stepped in Christine's blood in the kitchen before it had been cleaned. The shoe print patterns that are shown in the luminol were, in fact, consistent with sort of the pattern of the bottom of the shoes that were found in Mr. Fitzhugh's vehicle. The blood stains found on Ken's shirt and shoes were medium velocity blood spatter. This definitely didn't support Ken's story. The stains are all consistent with being near the source of blood at the time that the beating took place. Even more damning was the fact that the blood on the sides and tips of Ken's shoes had been diluted, consistent with standing nearby as blood was being cleaned with water. Dilute blood is often easy to recognize because when it dries, the edge of the stain will be darker than the center of the stain. And where was Ken between 12.20 p.m. to 1.40 p.m., the time of his wife's murder? Mr. Fitzhugh says that he had left the house around 11.30-ish and had driven up to Belmont, an area of about 40 minutes north of where he lived, to examine a vacant lot. No one saw Ken at this lot, and Ken's cell phone record showed he wasn't in that area when the school called to tell him his wife was missing. So it kind of destroyed his alibi of where he was located. He, he was actually in the Palo Alto area when he received the phone call. Prosecutors believe Ken's motive was secrecy. He didn't want the divorce or anyone to know he wasn't the biological father of his oldest son, and he didn't want anyone to know they were virtually bankrupt. It was almost like a clock exploded, and all the little springs and levers and wheels of the clock that had been so tightly wound up in that clock just exploded all over the landscape. Two weeks after Christine's murder, Ken was arrested. Prosecutors said the evidence showed Ken planned his wife's death. The evidence suggests he parked a short distance away from his house and found his wife in the kitchen where she was having lunch. He attacked her in the kitchen. Blood landed on his shirt, his shoes, the kitchen chair, the floor, and the walls. The autopsy also revealed he strangled her. Ken wanted to make Christine's death look like an accident. To stage the scene, he dragged her body down to the basement, leaving blood all over the steps. As he attempted to clean the blood, water splashed on his bloody shoes, diluting the stains, which proved he was there during the cleanup. Then, he took Christine's shoes and placed them on the steps to support the fake story that she tripped. Ken put his bloody shirt, shoes, and towel in his SUV. He never imagined police would search his vehicle, since Christine's death would be ruled an accident. He picked up two co-workers to support his alibi, but he was much later than he expected, since the cleanup took more time than he anticipated. His cell phone record showed he was still in Palo Alto when Christine's school called to say she missed her afternoon class. Everyone agreed Ken did an extraordinary job cleaning the scene. 
but he couldn't clean everything. Luminol revealed the extent of the cleanup, and the autopsy results left no doubt. He thought, I'll make it look like an accident. Nobody's going to believe I committed a crime. One year after the murder, Ken Fitzhugh was convicted of second-degree murder and sentenced to a minimum of 15 years in prison. Ken still maintains his innocence, but the forensic evidence left no doubt he was Christine's killer. You get the lumen on, you see that there's this, you know, cleanup, and, uh, you know, you've got somebody lying about where they were. You've got evidence pointing to no one but him. You never really know what's going on behind closed doors. You never really know what people's lives are like. They, they have a face, they present a face well, but you really scratch below the surface, and sometimes you find these ugly things that, that are going on.